Hi, everyone. This is Stephen Kilger. Uh, just reaching out to you before we start the podcast. Uh, the interview with Don Gotchert, the audio's a little rough. I Unfortunately, we could only talk over the phone, so it's a, a little messed up. But it's still a great interview, and I hope you can uh, enjoy it as it is. Thank you so much. And on to the podcast. Hi, everyone. My name is Stephen Kilger. I'm the managing editor of Feeding Grain Magazine and the host of the Feeding Grain Podcast. Thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, my guest is Don Goshert. He's the vice president of Sterling Systems and Controls. He's been in the industry for over 30 years, the entire time in automation and system control. So I figured we would talk to him a little bit about the history of that part of the industry and where it's at right now. He has a lot of great stories and a lot of great expertise on this topic. So I want to thank Don. Thank you, Don, for joining me today. And I also want to ask anyone if you have an idea or for a topic or a podcast guest, please go to feedinggrain.com slash podcast. There's a little button there that you can submit and it'll send a message directly to me that's with your idea and I'd be happy to hear from you. Thank you so much for listening. Don, thank you for joining me. Why don't you tell everyone a little about yourself? Don Gashert and Vice President of the Sterling Systems and Controls. I'm responsible for pretty much the day-to-day -day activities of the division. We are a division of IMI Holdings, which is industrial magnetics, and there's three companies under the umbrella of Trader Industries, Sterling Controls, and IMI Magnetics. Okay. Excellent. Well, so can you tell me a little bit about your history and especially the female automation industry? Yeah, I've been with company 38 years. I was basically a mechanical designer draftsman. I found the company really intriguing from the automation standpoint. The technology. I furthered my career going into um, some business classes, electrical classes, and uh, programming classes, and so forth through the years. I was fortunate to have some very gracious bosses that gave me an opportunity to advance in the company. I was moved into from drafting, help production, building panels, going in. I was moved into a service, and that was kind of an addition to the other things I was doing already. And then a few years later, I was moved into a sales position that was really extremely beneficial to go through the service part of the business and seeing basically how the systems operated and how they were built and so forth and design and the logic. Uh, we really pretty much focused on the egg industry, females in particular, and I went on my first service call, and I was really focused on technology, and I really was fascinated how the feed mill changed being automated to not being automated. I saw the opportunity for to take it even further, the, the automation and so forth. Excellent. That's really interesting, and that's kind of the perfect person I wanted, wanted to talk to you for this because I want to know a little bit about the history of automation and feed. Can you tell me a little bit about what things were like when you kind of first entered? What was the technology being used? What were what were kind of the breakthroughs at the time? Because things must have changed so much since even that 38 years, which we basically went from proprietary hardware and software, building our own circuit boards, and our competitors did the same things pretty much. They were in the same shoes that we were in, and we built a microprocessor board and a board that controlled the 120-volt real-world interface. The biggest technology change that I went through in the late 80s, early 90s, we saw the evolution of the PLC, Programmable Logic Controller, and that really changed the game for the technology. We went from using proprietary 
circuit boards and microprocessors to use as a PLC. A PLC was didn't have a lot of memory in those days, but we used to use it in conjunction with a PC, a personal computer. And the personal computer was basically used for the data storage and like the formulation and the sequencing and so forth. And they would tell the PL to run the spin and solder and PLC would do that. And then the PLC would, would report back what the weight was when we got to the tire that we, the uh, PC said, okay, stop, you've weighed enough ingredients and so forth. It was very, interesting and intriguing as far as seeing everybody's proprietary software, proprietary hardware just become a naughty word in the industry. And viewed that proprietary customers said they don't want anything to do with it. So we started building our control on the platform of non-proprietary hardware and the software we have the option of proprietary as well as non-proprietary. Non-proprietary is a little less expensive. Proprietary is more expensive. Those were the biggest changes that I saw in the late 80s, early 90s. Yeah. Just to interject, when you were building your own circuit boards and things, what kind of tasks were those able to perform? The same tasks. It was basically batching, weighing, mixing. The formula was limited you know, because memory is like personal computers. They evolved, and as they evolved, basically our systems evolved. You know, we were 64K was all the rate at the time. And as far as as time passed, we became there was so much opportunity for advancement. We had thousands of unlimited storage of formulas and data and so forth. And so the technology was the biggest change at first. The first change that I saw, it was basically the hardware and software, the batching process. Are there any other kind of big technology breakthroughs that you've noticed over your careers of the change the way that things have operated? There's the technology that I've seen is more on the data side, tracking lots of ingredient lot information, finished product lot information, tracking every ingredient that goes into the mixer and is mixed and at the finished product. That has been the biggest technology change in the last 15 years. It's more data driven. Everything's data driven now. We interface with least cost formulation software. You do a lot of ERP interfaces with people's customer business software, basically telling them inventories, what we have to use out of inventory into production, and then the finished product. We're really tracking all the ingredients through the process and doing a really good job of being able to go back and say, okay, we had batch that didn't turn out right, and what happened? And, okay, we found that one of the ingredients that was used, the lot number, was not as effective as it should have been, and that we had to add more of that ingredient, whatever the situation was, to make that batch good as they would like to be. So, I don't want to say recall, that's a terrible word to use, but you would be able to look at a batch and say, okay, there's a lack of salt in this finished feed, and then we find out maybe the salt scale was not calibrated right or it was malfunctioned, and that would be a red flag for our customers to stop that batch from getting it out in the field and making it to the the livestock can correct it before it was being delivered. Very good. Cool. When we talk about key technology breakthroughs, what, what new technology, what emerging technology do you see that might be the next big step, the next big game changer in the way we automate feed bills? From my standpoint, when we go into a feed bill, they are not currently tracking the data as such as lot information automatically is being written down by hand. That is a game changer for a lot of our customers because being able to retrieve information really quickly 
going digging through manual logs is time consuming. Basically, you type in a lot number now, you can pull up the information and see exactly where it was used, which path it was used for, and what customers received that. Everything is so integrated from the data side. I would say probably 20% of our customers are there now, and the rest of them are catching up. They're still doing it manually. It's a really big breakthrough for the industry more than us. From a technical standpoint, we can do that. We have been doing that. We're very diversified. We lost in the food industry, batching and weighing and funding, as well as many other industries. But the ag industry is kind of our bread and butter industry. It's good people to get a person that normally is trying to solve problems, not just looking at you to say what happened. It's just really a good industry to be in. It's hard not to love the ag industry because everyone is usually so nice and friendly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think that implementing the data interface between business software, um, the plant floor data, as well as the customer receiving orders and filling them automatically, it's almost, I hate to use words, it's overused, but it can be so seamless and doesn't require multiple data entry points. And it's just so much more integrated than it was ever thought to be in the early years of, you know, mid-90s and so forth. We really focused on the data side since the early 2000s, and it keeps growing and growing. And more information from the backing system through the automatic inventory control where you have three order points. So you're purchasing, people don't have to hear from the plant that we're out of this ingredient. What can we use in place of it? And then they get the people that do the formulas involved, and it's just an afterthought. And now it's becoming more intuitive, and they're foreseeing what's going to be needed in the future for inventories and so forth. Because you mentioned that we've been able to collect data for a long time, but now the amount of data that can be collected is starting to get more and more staggering. <laughs> so, and the, and the, sharing, the sharing of the data is where we see more and more requests in something that we do more and more of every day, integrating the data with other data systems, ERP systems, so forth. The control systems and automation is always something I've been fascinated with, and especially lately when we have all these stories about labor shortages throughout the industry. What control systems automation do you think that people should really be implementing if they want to try to help themselves to <laughs> kind of labor shortages and try to reduce the amount of staff that they need on site? I think about that first email that I was involved in starting up, and I saw three to four people just running around the place with wave buggies and so forth, and they were working really hard. And I came back to that plant a couple of years later, and they're down to one operator, and they were adding the hand ads. They added a micro-ingredient system that weighed 80% of the ingredients, and they were only responsible for dumping in 20% of the ingredients. Some of them gained quite a bit of weight over the years. I was really intrigued how it changed the facility. Micro-ingredient systems for the future, right now, the way the batching systems work, there's a lot of 50-pound bags being cut into the mixer, and that need to do that is practically eliminated. So old 80-20 rule, 80% of the weight, is weighed up automatically, and 20% of the end end ingredients are, you know, you're talking about a 50 pounds or 100 pounds weighed manually. And that's kind of the oddballs that they don't run very often, or they're just maybe weighing a quarter of a pound or per ton or something like that. So they want to do it manually and, and make sure they're accurate. That's one thing that I can see as a game changer for the labor shortage. We've been doing micro-ingredient systems for a long time, pretty much since I've been with the company. As a matter of fact, that's the first project I worked on was a minor grow ingredient system, and that was big labor savings. And as labor gets tighter and tighter, 
I see more interest in that. As a relatively young guy who has already had back surgery, too, at least automation hopefully saves some employed backs, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you, you're right. I mean, there's there's a lot of truth to that. I mean, I've been on projects that they've had a lot of worker count issues, and they're breaking 500 pounds of worth of product in a mixer and one ingredient and 500 pounds another ingredient, and, and they're working hard, and they're trying to make feed as fast as they can, and that's the bottleneck of the system. A lot of people think when they're taking automation, they think, oh, it's going to make my feed more efficient, make it faster, we'll be able to get more product out. But then also the safety and the man hours saved, all that stuff. It's just those are all huge benefits that might not always come to the top of mind when they're thinking about that kind of stuff. Yeah. So what do you think the first steps should be when thinking about upgrading of the automation levels on your mill? Automation, the batching itself, requires feedback from the field devices. And a lot of the emails don't have the feedback devices like limit switches and, and level sensors and elevator feed and belt alignment and different things. So there's kind of what I call the hidden cost of automation. The control batching system Okay, it's that amount of dollars. But to get that system to work automatically, you could spend half of the backing system cost or more just in field devices for the control system to read. Yes, automation is great, but you get to really think beyond what the backing control is going to turn off the auger and weigh all the ingredients into the scale. But once the scale of those gain is open, and we don't know that, the ingredients basically is a funnel going into the mixer. We're not getting any readback from the weight instrument because the gain is open on the scale. So you have to have the field devices in place to say, yeah, the scale gate's closed, go ahead and start weighing the ingredient. Same thing with the mixer. Our mixer is mixing right now. You can see the mixer motor turning. Don't drop the ingredients from the scale. The field devices are kind of the hidden cause of the automation. It's interesting to think about because you don't realize it, right? Like you said, it's a hidden cause. Well, it's because, you know, technology breaks through the fact that we all have little supercomputers in our pockets now. And, you know, even before the cell phones, a plant would basically start, push the start button, and have the, the operation would be all automated, and they were delivering feed. The part that was missing when they came back to get their load, the mill might have been stopped because of an alarm condition arose while they were out delivering feed. So they were basically down for that period of time. Now they were they have uh, this handheld computer, basically, that tells them, hey, you got alarm condition, take it back to the mill, check the, what the, the alarm condition out or is. I also see there's a, a lot of maintenance software that tells the maintenance staff the hours of motors been running, the bearings need to be greased, and that's a maintenance module. That's kind of a thing that people rely on more and more because they are short staffed and they can't be can't remember everything that needs to be maintained and greased and oiled and recalibrated and so forth on a maintenance schedule. That's, a, that's something that we have incorporated in our software as well as the, the remote monitoring that I spoke of. It's that advantage of everything to the middle being connected, right? It's not just for batching and stuff, but it's we kind of have all this data coming in. There's more and more uses for it, which is always really cool. Those are all the questions I have. Uh, anything else you'd like to add? No. Um, I appreciate the opportunity. Well, thank you so much for talking to me today and getting this information out to our readers. I really appreciate it. Okay, Stephen.